Once you've purchased a new piece of technology, learning exactly what everything means and how it affects your end goal can be an intimidating and very long process. Rapsodo is no different. There's a lot to learn, and not a lot of direction provided, and that can start to make your head spin. In today's video, I will be providing a general overview to serve as your guide when you first begin to crack down on your pitching Rapsodo. So to begin with, let's start by describing exactly what Rapsodo is. Rapsodo is a mobile device that tracks the flight of each pitch, utilizing optical tracking technology. It's set up 15 feet and 6 inches in front of home plate, and it is then connected to an iPad via a wireless signal to provide instant feedback onto an easy-to-read dashboard in the Rapsodo app. It has become an industry leader for aiding in the pitch design process. It spits out a ton of information on each pitch, and this is where the fun begins. Rapsodo provides you with the instant feedback that is so crucial for aiding in the pitch design process, but what does it all mean and what should you do with it? That's where I come in. Let's take a look at a mock-up of the Rapsodo dashboard. To me, it can be broken down into a couple different parts. The first is going to be the menu. The menu is the selection of host options located on the left side of your screen that gives you the ability to change your settings, adjust your player's information, utilizing their camera, and showing you that it's connected and calibrated to the device, as well as the battery levels of each device. This serves as your general hub and isn't something you'll need to mess with much after you have your Rapsodo set up. The next section is going to be your pre-pitch action list. This is the only manual operation that you will perform on every pitch, and that'll be selecting exactly which pitch is coming in. They've got every pitch classification that I can think of, including an other option if you guys throw something else. You will select the pitch type prior to every pitch that the pitcher throws. Next is going to be the description of what happened on each pitch. This is where your more in-depth analysis begins to come into play, and where a lot of people tend to get lost. It'll spit out the velocity of each pitch, exactly how it's spinning, where it's released and how, as well as keeping a running total of your guys' pitch count for this bullpen. This explains why each pitch moves the way that it does. This last section is the result of what actually happened on the pitch. And like I said, this is a result of every other metric that we looked at earlier. How much did the pitch actually move and where did it end up in the zone? Now let's take a deeper dive into each section. First we'll take a look at the velocity tab. This is going to be pretty self-explanatory. It's going to spit out the velocity of each pitch, as well as keeping a running average and maximum speeds for each individual pitch type. This should be pretty simple to follow and everybody should be pretty familiar with what this tab means. Next is our general information tab in the bottom left, like our pitch count and release data. This again shouldn't be very difficult to understand. Your release data is going to tell you exactly where the ball was released in space. In our example, this pitch was released 6.1 feet above the ground and 1.9 feet from the center of the rubber. Then we can look at our release angle to see the direction that this pitch was released up or down out of the hand. Then the horizontal angle will tell you the way it was released left and right. This will vary more on each pitch location, but it's a very important place to look once you begin to dive into pitch tunneling. Now it's going to get a little more complicated as we get up here into the spin direction and spin efficiency tabs. But bear with me, we're going to get through this. Our spin direction is going to be the direction that the ball is spinning from around its axis. So in this example, we will have a 145 tilt on our changeup. That means that there is backspin on this ball coming from the point about three quarters of the way between one and two on our clock overlay. Then, Rapsodo will spit out the total spin rate that was generated on the pitch. Comparing that to the gyro degree is going to calculate the spin efficiency, which in turn allows us to calculate our true spin, which is going to be 87% of our total spin. Now, like I said, this is a very complicated subject. But these two numbers, spin efficiency and gyro degree, are very important and closely related. Lastly, let's check out the results tab. This graph in the top right corner is going to tell you exactly how each pitch's spin is going to affect its movement. So if you can imagine a knuckleball with no spin floating through the air, it would still appear to drop with gravity. That is our zero zero point on this graph. As you move away from that centerpiece, it is going to be where the ball ended up compared to where it would have without spin. So in our example, the pitch had 12.3 inches of horizontal break and 6.8 inches of 
positive vertical break. That means that it had arm side run of about a foot and then because of the back spin on the ball it technically rose 7 inches compared to where it would have gone with gravity. Like I said, this is a results panel. Looking at all of these other numbers allows us to see exactly why this pitch moved the way that it did. If we overlay our clock onto this graph, you will notice that the pitch ended up right in line with our 145 mark. Then our determining factor for how far away from our midpoint our pitch was going to be is the useful spin. If that number goes down, then the pitch moves in line towards the center of the chart. And if that goes back up, it will move back outwards. It's all closely related. Then finally, there's the location of each pitch where it actually crossed home plate. This graph will also show our zero movement pitch, or where that pitch would have gone without spin. Then we will move 12 inches across and about 7 inches up to find where the pitch actually crossed through the zone. Although this is flipped because the top graph is from the pitcher's perspective and the bottom is the catcher, hopefully you can begin to see the similarities here. And that's what Rapsodo is all about understanding how these metrics work together to aid in the pitch design process, and it takes a lot of time and practice to get good at. But why does this all matter? If you are a new coach just now beginning to study pitch design, the best way to make yourself a valuable addition to any team is going to come from actually understanding how to interpret and apply the information produced on each pitch here on Rapsodo. To me, this information is like getting to use a calculator on a math exam. Without it, you can still get to the right answer, but with it, you can zoom right to it. That's what pitch design is for me using the Rapsodo. With a good pitching coach, you can eventually create a nasty pitch, but with this technology, you are able to get there quicker by utilizing quantifiable data on what is going to be a good pitch and what is going to be a bad pitch. And that's what I've got for you today. Hopefully this helps shed a light on exactly what each reading on Rapsodo means. But if you have any further questions about that stuff, check out the description for some of my other videos that take in-depth dives into all of these topics. Thanks for watching. If you liked today's video, please leave a like. It really helps support the channel. Comment any questions or suggestions for a future video, and subscribe for more weekly baseball animations posted every Wednesday.